Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Today, the Defense Department, thanks to very hard work by Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, as well as his team working in concert with the Office of Management Budget. Today, the Department is submitting to Congress our plan for finally closing the facility at Guantanamo once and for all. It's a plan that reflects the hard work of my entire national security team. So I especially want to thank Ash and his team at DOD. This plan has my full support. It reflects our best thinking on how to best go after terrorists and deal with those who we may capture. Well, the sociopath has done it again. And keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon for the wheel. The sociopath has done it again. Thanks, Bobby. And there's no thanks, Bobby. Go have a J and leave me alone. So uh, he thanks Ash Carter, who was very busy putting transgenders into the uh, mil Marines and into all aspects of the military. That's, of course, the most important uh, product now in the military is putting diversity above national security. And then, of course, uh, the psychopath in between golf rounds made sure last night that we were all shocked uh, learning that immigrants with HIV and STDs would now be welcome to America. They decided to let Immies with three sexually transmitted diseases known for causing sores or lesions on genitalia to enter the once great United States. This was expanded by the psychopath in the White House through his wholly owned subsidiary, the Department of Health and Human Services. They now open the borders to those with STDs. They said that the communicable diseases known as AIDS uh, and other uh, STDs are not a threat to the United States. Now, as you, are the, as you know, the psycho has broken the budget. The psychopath has broken the budget on every level. Do you know what this is going to cost you? Do you know what it's going to cost to welcome in aliens with these STDs? Do you know how many hundreds of millions of dollars a year this is going to cost us? That's not even talking about the disease they're going to spread in the country. So now we wake up and you, you ask yourself, what is this maniac's motive for closing Gitmo? Why does he, what's his vendetta? What's he really after? What is he after? I am questioning you, the audience of the Savage Nation, the brightest audience in talk radio history, to come up with your ideas of why he wants to close Guantanamo Bay. In plain English, Guantanamo Bay is part of the island of Cuba. It is our devil's island. It has been our devil's island for a long time. It's been used to house the worst people on the planet. People who, if found guilty, and by the way, if they're not guilty, what are they doing in Guantanamo to begin with? They're put there because they're guilty. If they're so guilty of consorting with terrorists or plotting terrorism, why have they not been executed to begin with? Why don't you just line them up in front of a firing squad and give it back to Castro? Now, the question is, why does he want so badly to bring these arch-terrorists to the United States of America? He wants to bring them on our soil. This is the whole crux of the issue here. He's not just closing down Guantanamo Bay prison, which is on the island of Cuba, but he wants to bring the world's worst terrorists to America, to house them in prisons that we have here, whether it be Florence, or uh, Fort Leavenworth, now housing Marines who did their job too well. Yeah, Leavenworth now has some of our Marines who killed too many Iraqis while fighting for their lives and the lives of Americans. If they did their job a little too well, they're, they're rotting in Fort Leavenworth. I've helped get some of them started in their life after they were let out by raising money for them. Now, why does the psychopath or the sociopath in the White House have such a desire in his, the waning months of his mad, mad reign of terror to do this to us. He's gotten everything else he wants. Let's go down the punch list of Barry Obama. Let's turn the clock back to when this unknown fraud was foisted upon the American people. And let's go down the punch list and see what he's gotten and what he's got left to do. Let's see. Amnesty for illegal aliens, check. There's a fundamental amnesty right now. He broke the border with Mexico. We're bleeding. 
and they're bleeding in their undesirables. That's right. Who do you think is coming in from these countries? The most desirable citizens? I don't see Carlos Slim trying to emigrate to America, do you? Do you see any Mexicans who are worth any property trying to come to America? No. So who are they? Who was coming in here? The most undesirable citizens of these countries are pouring into this country. I know it's harsh. I know it hurts. It's like a gut punch. But analyze what I just said to you. So now he wants to bring in on top of that immigrants with HIV and STDs into America. So now he's done that punch the list. Let's go down the punch list. Obama's mad punch list. Amnesty for illegal aliens. Check that off because it's happened already. It doesn't matter whether or not it's been rubber stamped by the Stooges in Congress. We have that. Let's see. Gays in the military. Oh, that's an old one. Check that one off. Uh, let's see. Gay marriage. Oh, check that one off. Let's see. What else has any achieved yet? Uh, printing as much money as he wants without going to jail for being fundamentally a counterfeiter. Check that one off. He's taking control of the Treasury, which is not his job, by the way. He's not even in his job category. He has fundamentally become a counterfeiter. The world's greatest counterfeiter in the world's history is Barack Obama. No one's ever said that before. You haven't heard it on another show. So I know it's shocking to hear, but he's basically acting like a counterfeiter. He is printing our currency ad libitum as often as he wishes. Let's go down the punch list. What else has he done? Let's see. Oh, well, there's a recent one. A justice died under suspicious circumstances. He's now chuckling that he's going to replace the judge. He's bypassing Congress in his own mind already. God only knows what he's threatening them with in Congress. Replacing the judges. What else? Let's see what else he's done. Can anyone name anything on Obama's punch list that he has not achieved during his reign of madness? I can. There's a few things left. He has not gotten rid of the Second Amendment. He has not gotten around the Second Amendment. He has not figured out a way to take guns out of your cold, dying hands. So that's one big one. But you know, there's a lot of time left. Look what Bush did in the last months of his reign of terror. Bush bankrupted America. Bush busted out the economy in order to feed his friends uh, who did this to us in order to pay back his contributors, in my estimation. He busted the economy. I had called him a fiscal socialist in the August of that year, and I'll take credit for that. I was a 1,000% right. That's right. You keep saying, oh, wow, they, wanna, they want socialism in America. We must fight it at all turns. Bush was a fiscal socialist. What were he doing? You have to check it up in a book? You have to read it on a conservative website to see if it was said before? It was said before by me in 2007. I said, Bush is a fiscal socialist. So you already have socialism, by and large, maybe to the 70th percentile. Medicare, Medicaid, EPA, you name all of the alphabet agencies of the federal government, what do you think they are? Socialism, my friends, an overbearingly top-heavy, centralized government. So don't sit there and think you're living in a free society, in a capitalist society. So let's see, he has not yet been he's spying on Americans without going to prison. Check that one off. Let's see, using all of the police agencies that he has under his power not to really fight terror, but to fight the American patriots. Check that one off. Let's see, seizing federal land and killing people with impunity. Check that one off. Let's go down the list. What has the madman, the psychopath, the sociopath, the imposter ha not yet checked off on his checklist when there's only a few things left? Let's see. Allowing illegal aliens to vote in America, thereby rendering our votes meaningless? That's already happened. He has fought every voter ID law successfully. There's been no pushback. So let's see what hasn't he done yet. Let's see now. Uh, close Guantanamo and bring the terrorists to America. Now why? Take away your right to bear arms. Well, that you know why. So we can have the exact power that Castro has over his people, turn them into slaves in essence, frightened little slaves. So he's got a few things left on his little punch list as he goes out the door and goes on to better things. One of them is Guantanamo, and you have to ask yourself why it's so important to him. I question the level of importance is the whole issue of today's program, at least in this first hour. Why is Barry Obama so crazy to uh, close Guantanamo and to get these terrorists onto our shores. Why? And to go back to the opening statement, 
The reason they're on Guantanamo, which is our devil's island, is because they're devils. And devils need to be dealt with the way devils should be dealt with. If they are innocent, if they are innocent, they should be freed. If they are guilty as charged, they should be executed for having committed crimes against our nation during wartime. Why are they bringing him here? Why does he want immigrants with HIV and STDs welcome into the United States of America? Why is he not stopping the Zika virus by banning all travel to and from the nations where the Zika virus is raging? Why? Tell me why. Why is he letting a record number of children from Central America flood into this country? Every one of them will become a burden upon the American taxpayer. Why is he going to use executive action to close Guantanamo and bring these detainees into the United States of America? How many Guantanamo inmates who have been freed have gone back to fight against America? What percentage of them uh, are recidivists? It's a big word. I know it's a tough word for liberals. Recidivists. You won't hear that on the campaign trail because most of the candidates talk in two or three syllables. Boys and girls, I will make America great again. I will make America hate again. Take your choice, one from column A or one from column B. That's the opening to the show. Now, yesterday, I I don't know whether I hit a new high water, but I didn't have one caller in three hours. I started out slow and like a good symphony, I ended uh, at a very quick pace. Today is going to be different. I'm going to take a lot of calls. Yesterday was a no call day. People didn't even understand it. They said, oh, Savage didn't have any calls. No, I had jammed lines the whole time. But I didn't get to them because my mind was flowing. It was flowing with ideas. I was inspired all day long. I wanted to speak with you, my loyal audience. I treat each day on radio as though it is my last. It is one of the greatest gifts to have in radio, by the way, is to not sit there thinking that you're going to be on the air forever because only God has that power. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? I visited a friend last night who was 87 years of age who was very sick. He fell off a motor vehicle, let's say a two-wheel motor vehicle. I had told him for years to stop riding the motor vehicle. I said, stop it, you're going to get killed one day. Well, a few months ago, his motor scooter fell over, and he, it fell on him, and he broke ribs. I said, stop it, you're going to die. Now, he's a man of means. He's a wonderful person. He's given so much to the world. I would consider him my best friend. I have about one or two friends in the whole world, which I consider to be uh, very lucky. Outside of my family, I have two friends, truthfully. He's one of the two. And I visited him last night, and I didn't know what to do to help him. I told him about certain vitamins and stuff that could help his hearing, healing go faster the doctors knew nothing about. And initially for a week or so he was following my advice and his spirits had gone up. And then one of the quacks probably talked to him and cut the dose down and he wasn't feeling well last night. And I explained to him the way I explain in Diseases Without Borders how uh, what, what proper dose to take, particularly in this case of ascorbic acid. Vitamin C said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, yes, a flat teaspoonful is four grams. Well, he had cut it back to one and a half grams, and his mood, his spirits had gone down. I said, I said, John, vitamin C crosses the blood-brain bar brain barrier faster than heroin. The molecule is that small. It's one of the greatest mood enhancers in the world. Now, most of you take powder, uh, don't, don't take powdered C, so you take pills. They're worthless. Most vitamin C pills are dead. You may as well be taking straw. I try to explain that to him. So he got the powder and he took it. I'll get back to the main theme of the story. I had <clears throat> gone over the bridge to see him. This goes right back to Guantanamo. Again, the red light came up. See, I could go on now like a filibuster for five straight hours. I feel it again. I'm feeling the spirit. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm on some kind of new vitamins or something. I'm feeling the spirit again. But I promise you, we will get to the callers right here on the Savage Nation. story and get back to my main question, which is, should we close Guantanamo Bay prison or not? I said Gitmo is our devil's island. 
If any of them are innocent, release them. If they're guilty, execute them by firing squad and give Guantanamo Bay back to the Castro criminal regime. But I want to go back to my story about visiting my sick friend last night. I, I drove over the bridge. Sometimes I work in, in, in a county north of San Francisco. I drove in. I was going to have dinner. It was a beautiful night. Visited my friend. I didn't feel good after visiting with, with him because I realized how fleeting life is, is the whole point. He is, I would say is, because he's still with us, one of the most dynamic people I've ever met on in my whole life. He has given away fortunes to hospitals and charities around the world. He's a wonderful man. I wanted to take his motor scooter away from him. I wanted to throw it into a river months ago. I had an instinct to throw his keys away. He wouldn't listen to anybody. He once said to me, I'd rather... He said, I'd rather die on the motor scooter than be imprisoned. The guy could afford 18 chauffeurs a minute. He doesn't want him. He's a free spirit. So he had this accident. Some idiot woman crashed into him. So I looked at him, you know, and I said to myself, you know, tomorrow that's you. I could fall off a bicycle, right? Uh, an airplane could fall out of the sky that I'm on. I could go to a resort and wind up with a pillow over my head. I could eat a meal in a restaurant that's poisoned. I can just get a, a, a food in any local restaurant and get sick from it, the way they're making food today. You can't believe the garbage. I, I just can't believe what I'm looking at. The, the filth that's in the food when you actually analyze it. So the bottom line is, is that coming back to radio and this whole topic of today is, should we close Gitmo or not? And I said Gitmo is our devil's island. Why does the psychopath in the White House have such a desire in the waning days of his regime his hateful regime, his devious regime, his painful regime, his poisonous regime, his toxic regime. Why does he want to do this so badly? He doesn't have to do this. Why is he doing this? Do you have an answer to this? It's the most important question I could ask you today, apropos of the story I just told you. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Does, uh, the reason I'm playing Cuban music again, I guess that's what drove me yesterday, is because this is about Cuba. And uh, this music's from the era that I like the best, the Cuban music I like the best. But the fact is, I'm asking a question, why Why is Obama, have, why does he have such a vendetta, an, uh, almost a mania, let's put it that way, such a mania to get this done to close Guantanamo? Why is he closing it? What are his arguments? He hasn't given any. He's spoken generalities as usual. We have our plan, and it's Ash Carter, that moron, a man who should be tried for war crimes against the military when it's all over. If Trump wins, they should try Ash Carter for the crimes he's done to the military. I don't think it can ever, Humpty can ever be fixed again. This guy is the worst of all of them, and he's in a long line of the most devious anti-American defense secretaries I've ever seen in my life. It goes back to Pancetta. Leo Pancetta should be on the docket. Every last one of them should be tried for the damage they have done to the greatest military the world had ever seen before the psychopathic left-wing maniac took office. But to calm down a bit, why does he have such a desire to close it? Now, I'm going to let you liberals out there who don't really know the issues but think you do, tell me why we should close Gitmo and release these terrorists or bring them to America. I want to hear your arguments because I think I can defeat your arguments quite readily. I believe that um, if they are innocent, release them. Let me be very clear. If they're guilty, execute them. It's that simple. They execute American soldiers who violate various conventions, don't they? We had guys put into prison for 20 years in Iraq under that thieving bum, George Bush, who did nothing, didn't lift a finger of his white hand to protect these Marines after they did their job, that evil man, George Bush. Don't you give me this garbage what a great president he was because he was a Republican. We begged George Bush to intervene and get those Marines out of uh, Leavenworth, get them out of these horrible, horrible uh, prisons that they were put in by these cowardly commanding officers who were all over, looking over their shoulder. And so guys were put away and George Bush did nothing. Some of them were given great sentences 
how come we're treating these Guantanamo uh, prisoners of war, which is what they are, with with kid gloves, and we treat our own men with such derision and hatred? And so the question is, I'm asking this question. Now, I'm opening it up to those of you who want to give me your liberal point of view of we should release them, bring them to America, afford them all of the benefits of the law. It violates this, it violates that. I'd like to hear your opinion. Now, there's another side note to this, which is Ben Carson said that President Obama grew up in white America. He's not really raised as a black man. He doesn't know anything about the black experience. I think that's a fascinating uh, question coming from an authentic African-American, Ben Carson. It's an amazing statement coming from him. He's finally showing some spine. Instead of wasting his time attacking Rubio or, or, or this one or that one, yeah, finally he's pointing it in the right direction. He pointed the, he aimed his naval guns in the right direction finally. Maybe Trump and Cruz and Rubio can aim their naval guns at the right targets instead of at each other. Falling for these stooges in the media who are telling them to point their guns at each other and have a, you know, a rodeo with each other. Speaking of which, uh, Trump is skipping the Fox News town hall hosted by uh, the deceitful Megyn Kelly. GOP frontrunner Donald Trump will skip a Fox News town hall event for GOP candidates hosted by the network's evil Megyn Kelly. Uh, he says that uh, yeah, they can't do it because it was put together at the last minute. The campaign has a previous engagement in Virginia and then New York, which could not be rescheduled. Sent, said Trump, Trump, Trump <laughs> spokesperson Hope Hicks told The Hollywood Reporter. I don't believe that's the reason. Megyn Kelly is being used as bait by Roger Ailes to attack Republicans again at the behest of his boss, Boss Tweed, who sits behind the scenes and pulls the strings. Ailes is just, remember, Ailes is as powerful as he is, works for someone. His god is Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is a Democrat who's supporting Hillary Clinton in my estimation. Rupert Murdoch is an open borders type of guy. Kelly uh, is used as bait. If it was not a family show, I would use other language. Kelly is being used as bait to bait the Republicans into another debate, and Trump didn't fall for it. So instead, the lesser candidates will be up there, the ones that will never win. Ben Carson, Ted the Vampire Cruz, uh, Marco the Ice Cream Man Rubio, and Governor John Crybaby Kasich, Kasich will appear on the, uh, at the town. What is Kasich doing up there? What in the world is he doing there? Well, I told you why they stay in it to the end. You know what kind of money is involved? How many times do I have to tell you? They can't steal the money and use it on their own. But think of all of the um, idiotic relatives, the near-do-well relatives and friends of family members, the ones who can't get jobs or have low-paying jobs that can suddenly be hired for a campaign at any salary that you want. There's no oversight. Do you know that? So they raise $100 million. They don't have to take it for themselves. They only got a fifth cousin who was working in a funeral parlor somewhere in Ohio, cleaning up the, the slop on the floor of a of a funeral parlor. Now suddenly he's a consultant to, to, to the candidate at 125000 a year plus all the pizza he can eat, plus first class and uh, bottles of water, whatever. You know the picture. So that's why they, they stay until the end. There's a lot of money in this. I was told this years ago. I was told to set up a super PAC. I said, what, are you kidding me? I'm not corrupt. I'm a talk radio host. I'm not greedy. This is what I do for a living. I do this and I write best-selling books. I don't do anything else. I don't need 50 things falling out of my hands to make a living. I don't have to prove to the next. It's like having watch bands up, up your arm now. Everybody wants to do 50 things at once. Do one thing well. So Guanta who's in favor of keeping it uh, cl uh, closing? Do we have a lib yet? Ah, here's a lib. We got two libs. Let's go to the lib on WJR in Detroit. Hello, Ron the Liberal. Why should we close Guantanamo Bay? Give us your opinion. Okay, this is why we should close it. Two reasons. First reason is it's costing me money out of my pocket. I'm a taxpayer. But the biggest reason is, look, these prisoners, if we are going to take them prisoners as a nation, these prisoners should be on American soil. We have plenty of prisons in this country. It is a waste of my tax dollar to put prisoners on some island way. And I know, oh, they're going to say, oh, then we're going to be attacked by them because we've got them. Ain't nobody attacking Cuba, okay? Look, these are our prisoners. <laughs> Let's take American responsibility for our what we're doing. I mean, you, yeah, that's, that's 101, man. You, that's, know, you actually haven't made a point yet. I don't even understand what you just said. The point is, 
What, what, you, have you given a reason to bring them here? I, I don't know the reason. The reason is, if we're going to take prisoners of war, they should be on our soil. But why? Why? Because well, we, they're our responsibility now. As a nation, they are the American government's responsibility. And I know people are going to scream and say, well, if we put... Wait, wait, I'm not screaming. I'm asking you, what, what do you mean they're our responsibility? They're given Korans. They're given um, halal meals. They're given prayer mats. They're treated better than most of our Marines who are in prison in Fort Leavenworth. They're being treated very well, plus they're on a, a sunny, sunny island in the Caribbean. What could be better? The problem, the thing is, because they're wasting our tax dollars. It's another fleecing of America that's going to corporate America. That's that they're wasting. All right, well, here we go, corporate again. Okay, everything's corporate. That's the new the buzzword. When you say corporate, do you get a visceral feeling of pleasure? I did corporate. When you, when you whenever you speak, let's say every few sentences, when you say corporate, if you're speaking to friends, do you get a chill up your leg? I, I'm what I'm saying is a waste of my tax dollars. That is just All right, so the only point you made that I find to be reasonable is that it's expensive. I mean, really. All right, no, okay, so you made a rational point. It's very expensive. It would be cheaper to put them where? Where would you put them? I, we have a Supermax in Colorado. I believe there's a couple other ones around. Let's bring them. All right, that's a rational argument. Why are they not being put in a, into a Supermax in Colorado? You're actually missing the number one reason that Obama really wants them here. It has nothing to do with money. You know why he wants them on, on our soil, don't you? Well, go ahead. Give me a... I, I don't know why, but give me a reason. No, you're a reasonable man, and you're reasonable enough to come up with a reasonable thing about money, and you're willing to call a radio talk show because you're a thinking person, right? I mean, you like to think things through. That's what I'm getting out of this. No, no sarcasm intended, right? I, I don't like him that much. I really don't. The only reasonable reason I can see he wants them to bring him over here, I... I I don't know. I don't even. I really. I don't have a reasonable explanation. It's unreasonable. Right. That well, I'll give. I'll give you a few reasons after the next liberal. I'll give the real reasons why. How's that? But since you're such a brave man to have called with your opinion, I'm sending you a free copy of uh, Government Zero. So stay on the line. Let's go to the next caller, Chris on WMAL in the heart of Washington. Uh, Chris on line one. Go ahead, please. Why should we close it? Basically, my argument just goes along the lines of what we do there is against the, the Geneva Convention and United Nations norm. And because of that... Okay, hold, hold on. No, you made your point. You don't have to add addendum to that. I heard it before. Okay. Where is it written that people who don't ascribe and follow the Geneva Conventions should be afforded the protections of the Geneva Conventions? Why should these animals be given protections according to the Geneva Conventions when they do the most horrible things to innocent men, women, and children of all religions and races? Who said they're entitled to those protections? Because they're human beings, Michael. Oh, no, 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 no. Not all people who walk in human bodies are human beings. There are devils walking around in human skin. Are you telling me, for example, you know what the, uh, what the Taliban, excuse me, what the ISIS has been doing to innocent girls in the Middle East, right? Mm-hmm. What do you mean, mm? Tell me what ISIS members have done and are doing in the Middle East to Yazidi girls that they capture. I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 well, of course you don't know because you read the college newspaper. It didn't make it to the college paper. They are passing them around like prostitutes, little innocent girls who was clean as you've ever seen, as innocent virgins. They're passing them around like the cheapest piece of meat that they could ever find, repeatedly raping them around the clock. Do you know that? So having said that to you, are you telling me that th that's a human thing to do to a young girl? I'm not saying that all of the people at, uh, at Guantanamo have done that. Mark. All right, you're making a good point. Not all of them rape young girls in a, in a theater of war. But what if someone has done something even worse than that? What if they've planted a bomb in a mosque, for example, filled with innocent worshippers of a different sect of Islam and blew up 150 men, women, and children? Do you think that that's a human, uh, the act of a human being? I, no. Okay. What I'm trying to say to you is we've got to stop living with a textbook view of the world. We're not living with a textbook enemy. These are people who are... In, by all estimation, the ones who commit these atrocities, they have left the human race. And there's a word for them, but if I use it, I, my argument will diminish because people will say that I'm something that I'm not. They have left the human race by their behavior, and I would argue 
that those who have left the human race by their despicable acts of war against human beings have no right to the constitutional con uh, c protections and they have no right to the Geneva Convention. None whatsoever. And one of the reasons that they were sent to Gitmo, my liberal friend, is because they were able to be questioned in a way they couldn't be questioned here. You know that? Thank you for the call. I mean, what's the point of having a dialogue? I think he's another intelligent guy who was trying to give an argument that was rational up to a point, because I've seen it. It violates the Geneva Convention. And the people, because you've got to understand, Obama, from the beginning, took the legal position that the captives brought to Cuba were not prisoners of war, but they fell into the vague, newly created legal category of enemy combatants. But I would say that anyone who falls into that category or has committed atrocities has lost the right to the protections of the Geneva Convention. And I would cite um, precedent for this. And I'll give it to you right now. World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as liberal as they come, as socialist by any estimation, a hero of Barack Obama, when Nazi spies landed uh, in America, they landed on Long Island, they were put ashore by submarine, U-boats brought them to, to New York, they landed in New York, and I think they landed on the beaches, they came ashore in New Jersey as well. Some of them were captured and uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly, and the others were captured within a few days in America. That's when we really had an intelligence service that took no prisoners. That's when they knew how to break down doors and beat people up to get the information. And believe me, they got the information. They, they caught those Nazis pretty quick. And take a guess what the fate of those Nazi prisoners of war were. Now, they had not yet even committed a crime. None of them had blown up a train. None of them had sunk a ship. None of them had blown up a schoolyard. They wouldn't do that, by the way, in those days. They weren't uh, the pra practitioners of the religion of peace. What do you think was their fate? They were, they, were, they were executed by firing squad under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Did you know that? That's what was done to enemies who came ashore to harm us. So now you have a president who has some of the worst people on the planet safely in detention in Guantanamo, and not only does he free the innocent, if there are any, and execute the guilty as he should, but he now wants to bring them to our shores. Ask yourself what Obama really wants to do here. Is this very liberal of him or something else? I'm Michael Savage, back in a minute. Guantanamo harms our partnerships with allies and other countries whose cooperation we need against terrorism. When I talk to other world leaders, they bring up the fact that Guantanamo is not resolved. Moreover, keeping this facility open is contrary to our values. What it undermines our standing in the world. What a liar. It is viewed as a stain on our broader record. Uh, You're a stain on the presidency. The highest standards of rule uh, of law. You know, law. I can't listen to him without getting very angry. Everything he says is a complete lie. And he's, a, he's talking about values. Don't you love this guy? He's stepped on every value that you can know of as a president. Now, what does he have such a desire for to close Guantanamo? It has nothing to do with what he's saying. Everything is something else. Why do we even have Guantanamo? That's a real question. Most of you don't even know what it is, where it is. You say Guantanamo, you think it's a prison in Miami. It isn't in Miami. It was seized in 1898 during the Spanish-American War in the Battle of Guantanamo Bay. 03 U.S. and Cuba signed a lease, granting the U.S. permission to use the land as a coaling and naval station. And we still have it. Private enterprise not allowed under the treaty. Ah! So once Guantanamo is given back to Cuba, American contributors get to build hotels there. That part of the reason? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders. 
language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. It is Cuban music for one reason. I like that trumpet. Because, well, let me hear it. What the heck? Guantanamo Bay is the issue. That's what it is. And this is old style Cuban music going back probably to the late 40s or 50s. No one even knows it anymore except the aficionados. And the point is, is that since we're talking about Cuba, I'm playing some Cuban music. The thin smoking man in the White House has such a vendetta against America that in the waning days of his uh, toxic regime, he's trying to jam it as much as he can. And one of the items that he's trying to jam down our throats is releasing their prisoners from Guantanamo, returning the land to Cuba for reasons we've discussed, and uh, releasing the prisoners, to putting them on American soil so that they are afforded all the constitutional protections that they're not entitled to. I'll go into that again. And then uh, we have the other issue, which we haven't gotten to yet. Ben Carson claiming Obama was raised white and doesn't understand black Americans. Now, we're allowed to play this because it's Ben Carson. He's saying what everyone in America knows to be true. Obama is a spoiled white kid. He's behaving like a spoiled kid. Put it, Take race out of it. He's a spoiled brat. He never worked a day in his life. Did he ever work in his life? Never. Did he ever hold a job? No. Did he ever produce a product that anyone can, can name? Did he ever produce a service that anyone ever bought? No. He's done nothing for the world. Nothing. Now you say, well, that's, you know, others. No, it's not true. I don't know of any other president in American history who never produced anything before becoming president. Can you name a few? I don't know. Let's say even G.W. Bush, the bumbler. Bush had jobs. I think Bush was a, in, in investment banking, wasn't he? He did something. Did something. He worked. Obama did nothing. He was a pot-smoking bum in high school. Then he became a pot-smoking bum at Occidental College, according to his own biography. Don't blame me. His own autobiography said he was a druggie. Then the bum went on to Columbia, where because of a certain... Uh, because of his race, in plain English, he was looked up to by the moron liberals. And he said that's when he became radicalized, when he realized the more he espoused the lines of the Black Panthers, the more respect he got from the white morons. Well, the rest is history. So here we are. Here's a man who's done nothing in his life except jawbone everybody to death with his booming voice and his great looks. And here we are. So now he's telling us he wants to close Guantanamo Bay for this reason and that reason. One is American values. And this, and that. It's all rubbish. And I'm asking you what the real reasons are. What are the real reasons are? And now we have the Ben Carson tape. I, let's play some of the Ben Carson stuff just for a minute. Let's hear it. Like most Americans, I was proud that we broke the color barrier when he was elected. Uh, but I also recognize that his experience and my experience are night and day. He didn't grow up like I grew up by any stretch, not, not even close. African -American. He's an African American. Uh, he was, you know, raised white. Uh, many of his formative years were spent in Indonesia. So for him to, you know, claim that, you know, he identifies with the experience of black Americans, I think is a bit of a stretch. Okay, just the next one. Just run it through and let's get it over with already. You have to recognize that what President Obama represents is an, an ideology that is antithetical to the ideology of most people in the Republican Party. And it, I don't think it has anything to do with race. I mean, Hillary represents that kind of ideology also. Uh, and they'll say it's because she's a woman. I mean, any guy... Who represents that kind of ideology is going to evoke exactly the same types of criticism. I wish that there were a million Ben Carsons marching on Washington. Boy, would I like to see a million Carson march. <laughs> you know, Carson grew up in Detroit with a single mother. She worked three jobs. And during this interview, he downplayed racism. He said that discrimination now in 2016 is far better than what he experienced growing up. And he said, remember, now, I've been around for 64 years. I've had a chance to see what real racism is. Dr. Carson added that classism, not racism, is the issue on the table. 
He said, a lot of things that people classify as racism is classism. And believe me, there's a lot of classism in our society. And if people of a certain race happen to fall into a lower class, then they get the brunt of it. It's an interesting story that his mother worked three jobs and that he was able to go to medical school. And I've got to tell you, you've got to hear this over and over again. As a trained academic before going into radio, there's a, a huge difference as in anything between doctors, okay? Not all doctors are equal, not all talk shows hosts are equal, not all baseball players are equal, not all fighters are equal, not all mothers are equal, not all moms are equal, not all fathers are equal, but I have to say it again. Not all presidents are equal, not all immigrants are equal. Ben Carson is a pediatric neurosurgeon, possibly one of the most difficult practices in the field, in all the fields of medicine. What does it mean? He performs brain surgery on infants and children. You can't fake that. You can't get it the way Obama became a politician. You can't talk your way into the job and keep it. You slip with the scalpel, you kill a child, or you damage him for life, then you're, you're out of business. So he didn't get through medical school based on affirmative action. He got through medical school based on his abilities. You, you should know that about him. It's important to say that again. It's very important to understand what a fine man he really is and how he achieved it all on his own. A mother, single mother, three jobs. It's, it's unbelievable to see that. I went in a store the other night to buy my grandchild a dress. It was, I don't know when it was. It was late at night. It was closing time on a Saturday night. They close at 8. I was in there a quarter to 8 in a little child's store in a, in a mall that was dark. And there was an African-American young woman behind the counter. She was probably tired. And we got off on the wrong foot. Maybe she thought I wasn't what I am. I don't know. She doesn't know who I am. So I said, I'd like the dress on a hanger. She said, I can't give you the hanger. I said, I'll pay for the hanger. I don't want it rolled up in a ball and thrown in a bag. I want it to be, I, I don't want to lose my job. So one word led to the other, and then we both backed off, and then we made up, and we're nice. We realized it was going in the wrong direction for no reason. And I got to talk with her because I tend to, I speak to people that I do business with, even if it's buying something simple. And I learned something by talking to people. And she, I said, do you have children? She said something about how old is your grandchild and this and that. And I said, do you have children of your own? She says, yes, I do. I said, well, you must be tired. I said, it's almost 8 o'clock. She says, this is my second job today. You know, your heart goes out to the woman. I don't care what the race is. The woman's working two jobs, raising a child alone. You think I don't see these things? I do see these things. And I see the difference between Ben Carson and uh, Al Sharpton. I see the difference between Ben Carson and Eric Holder. I see the difference between Ben Carson and Barack Obama. I see the difference between a Ben Carson and a race hater like Louis Farrakhan. You know, go down the list and you'll understand why Ben Carson is such an important figure in America right now. I, of course he can't win the nomination. I just pray to God that if Trump is nominated, he doesn't select. He, you know, I'm going to make a quick jump now. I didn't intend to do this. I may as well do it right now. If he picks Sarah Palin, he's finished. It's over. If he makes the mistake by listening to the morons who ran Romney's campaign and pick Sarah Palin or one of the idiots who chops wood for a living, where makes whistles for, for ducks, he's finished. He cannot pick Sarah Palin as a running mate. It's over. No one will vote for him. She's old goods. She's damaged goods. She's run the course. It's over. Nobody wants to look backwards. He's supposed to represent the future, not the past. She's the past. She had her time in the sun. Andy Warhol said 15 minutes of fame. She had 18 minutes of fame, and it's long enough for me. Those 18 minutes were excruciating. So you know, actually, I should speculate on who we should pick. I think I'll do that for you. If Trump wins the nomination, who should he pick as a running mate? Absolutely, it should be Ben Carson. Should be the VP uh, candidate. Why not? Why shouldn't it be Ben Carson? What is wrong with that? Will he pick Ben Carson? No. I, I can guarantee you as I stand here, Advisors who failed at everything they've done in their whole life except making extraordinary fortunes doing nothing correctly will advise them not to pick Ben Carson. They'll pick some stooge middle of the rotor and will destroy his candidacy, and Hillary Clinton will be president. Another candidate for him would be people you never heard of. Do you know that there's a black Republican congresswoman in, uh, in the West in Salt Lake City you never heard of her. You've never seen her since she was elected to, to, uh, to Congress, have you? 
Why is she not even in the campaign? Why do you never hear from her? Because the idiots who run the Republican Party have put her in the back of the bus. Instead, you see, you know, the same type, the country club Republicans, who are members of clubs that not only do you never, wouldn't be allowed into, you never heard of them. Secret clubs with secret handshakes. You know, Groucho Marx said I would never join a club that would have me as a member. It's a funny joke. Uh, but they belong to clubs that you never heard of. And they're going to wind up picking the wrong running mate for Donald Trump, as sure as I'm standing here. I can smell it. I can feel it. I have a visceral feeling that his campaign's already going in the wrong direction. I can sense things before anyone else. I'm still a Trump supporter, but I will tell you right now, point blank, what I see happening. Do you remember that other, the congresswoman who came on this show? What was her name? Do you remember her name, Robert? She asked for money on this show. Trump doesn't need money. She was saying that Nancy Pelosi is out to get her, and she was so conservative and send money. We helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for her. And shortly thereafter, she would never come on the show again. And then she fell into the abyss. She lost all of her creds, and nobody ever remembered. I, I forget her name up. And Who can name her? Come on, man. you got two guys sitting there on the screen. No one. Three people work for me. No one knows what I'm talking about. Is there anyone in the audience? What? Okay, you know, he says something. I can't hear him on the air live like I'm supposed to listen to him and talk to you. Put it on a screen. Can anyone listening to this show tell me the name of the congresswoman who came on this show as a strong conservative, raised a ton of money off you, the listener, and then soon ditched you and went on to... She thought greener pastures and never was never heard from again. Anyone know her name? That's right, Michelle Bachman. Do you remember that? Thank you, Robert. Michelle Bachman, and I sense the same thing is going to happen here. I can smell it from a mile away. I don't know why I do it. I have an instinct. I've survived all these years in radio because I have instincts that run out of the, the, the three dimensions of, of the norm. And I sense it happening already. It's going to happen. There's a certain point in a campaign where they get so big that they're no longer in control of their own, their own destiny. And destiny, you start listening to people, and the people that they listen to are the worst people on the planet. And they all make the same mistakes. Okay, but coming back to the big story of Obama wanting to close Guantanamo, that's what I want to get back to. And I want to, before we take our first commercial break, for the wonderful folks who sponsor this program, which you love so much, I want to listen to Mr. Obama in clip 06. Six, please. We'll continue to securely and responsibly transfer to other countries the... 35 detainees out of the 91 that have already been approved for transfer. Keep in mind this process involves extensive and careful coordination across our federal government to oh, ensure yeah. that our national security right, like the immigration are when an individual is transferred to another country. So, for example, we insist that foreign countries institute strong security measures. <laughs> and as we move forward, that means that we will have uh, around 60 and uh, potentially even fewer detainees remaining. Can anyone tell me which countries the previous detainees were released to and how tight the security is, Oma, is in, is in uh, Oman? Can anyone tell me how many of these monsters, these murderous monsters, have gone back to their business of killing, murdering, kidnapping, raping, and blowing things up? What the rate of recidivism is? Do you realize what a liar he is that he's saying this as though he, he makes things up as he goes along? They'll go to countries, insecurity, all aspects of government. Sounds good, doesn't it? To who? Who would believe a word that he just said? These are the most dangerous, hardened criminals on the planet, or they would have been released already. Why does he so intently want to bring them to American shores? Moreover, why does he want to give that land back to Cuba? What is really in it for him and the Democrat Party donors who stole my Presidio from me so greedy private developers could destroy this once great military base? How many local senators and congressmen have made fortunes here in San Francisco off the, off the land transfer of the Presidio? How many of the skunks in Congress have made fortunes off the transfer of military bases to private uh, sources? How many of them have made third, fourth party fortunes off this how many of them are in the construction business can you name the senators and the congresswomen whose husbands are mega contractors who build these enterprises because if you can then you could trace and follow the money all the way back to guantanamo back in a minute
So the fanatic in the White House has a desire to uh, close Guantanamo and bring prisoners to the American shores to give them all the benefits that our Constitution affords law-abiding citizens who get into trouble and to afford them all of the protections of the Geneva Convention. Now, I want to dispatch your uh, false impression that terrorists are entitled to such protections because they're not. A friend of mine just looked up the Geneva Convention. Many of you don't even know that it exists. There is a Geneva Convention of laws regarding to rules and law regarding war. And I'll read you Clause 18. By violating every tenet of international law regarding treatment of prisoners, terrorist groups forfeit any entitlement to protection under the Geneva Conventions. U.S. forces would be within their legal rights to treat captured Al-Qaeda members as they did Nazi saboteurs during World War II, trial by military commission and execution by firing squad. At least that's one legal opinion on that. The phone number here is 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-SAVAGE. Now let's go to the callers on the... Pro oh, I don't have time. We're just running through this quickly. Should we close Guantanamo or not, as the smoking, angry man in the White House would like to do? Remember, Gitmo is our devil's island. The devils who are on that island have all committed crimes against humanity, or they wouldn't be there. They would have been released by now. These are the worst of the worst. Why have they not been executed by firing squad? That's the real question. And why would Obama bring them to a neighborhood near you? is the second question, boys and girls. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. All right, have we, have we run through the uh, Guantanamo story? Because he made that a big issue today. It's a big, big, big issue. And Obama's sound bites on it. I mean, I need to play them. Then we're going to move on to who should Trump who should Trump choose as a running mate? I say if he chooses Sarah Palin, his campaign is over. It's dead in the water. It's finished. She's part of the past, not part of the future. She's old news. She's guava on the, rotting guava on the jungle floor. Over. Over. It should be either Ben Carson or someone else. Who would that someone else be? So now he's pushing to close Guantanamo for reasons that make no sense. Whatever. Listen to... Clip 08 on the Savage Nation, please. When it becomes clear that something is not working as intended, when it does not advance our security, we have to change course. For many years, it's been clear that the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay does not advance our national security. It undermines it. This Why? is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of experts. This is the opinion what of the experts? In our military. It's what experts? The same stooges who say that the, the sea, sea levels are rising? Propaganda in their efforts to recruit. It drains military resources. Oh, With nearly $450 million spent last year alone to Think keep Think of how much running. golfing you could do for that. More than $200 million in additional costs needed wow. to keep it open going forward. How much forward does it cost for your wife's for personal assistance per year? detainees. $200 million is chicken feed to him. If you added up the cost of personal assistance for him, his wife the mother-in-law, the travel, Air Force One, Air Force Two, golfing vacations. That comes to a pretty penny. I know he's trying to tighten his budget a little bit now toward the end to show how, how good he is in balancing the books. I think it's the first time he's actually have to, had a look at the books in his entire life. If a man never works a day in his life, how can he know anything about balancing a budget? That's why we're $13 trillion in debt, because he's spending like a madman, and no one stopped him. There's been no constraint. And it's very important you understand what this actually means. When he came to power, he, there was a $1 trillion national debt. It's now, what, $13 trillion? Who are you going to blame that on, Nixon? Why do you think he's run the budget up like this? Because he's printing money in order to buy off the people on the bottom and to pay off those who keep him in office and to buy off those who might throw him out of office. Is that clear enough for you? Write it down. It's three simple sentences. That money goes around. It's spread around. That money goes around and spread around, buys off donors, pays off those who might prosecute them, keeps the lower, uh, let's say, uh, the have-nots in line by creating programs for them that they're not entitled to. In other words, they're welfare programs of one kind or another, whether it's for consultants who run these stupid think tanks that do nothing or whatever. That's what the $13 trillion has gone for. In addition, 
to paying extraordinarily high amounts of money for things such as disability. Uh, the number of people on false dis disability claims is enough to fill a nation in the, in the country right now. The last I checked, 14 million people were on federal disability. How many of them do you think are actually able-bodied workers? Quite a few. How come he doesn't crack down on that? How much has it cost to bring in millions of illegal aliens and pay for all their services? How many billions of dollars does he give to Catholic charities, Baptist family services, all of the other fraudulent religious front groups? to service the illegal aliens that are pouring across our border. Where do you think those flat screens come from and the swimming pools and the training uh, for them and the this and the that? He's paying for it. So he's now suddenly worried about the cost of Guantanamo. It has nothing to do with the cost, in my opinion. Nothing, nothing whatever. So uh, the second question is who would be a good, a good uh, running mate for Donald Trump? I am totally and absolutely opposed to Sarah Palin. If Donald Trump's assistants or managers or whoever they are listen to this show, and I think they do, since many of the things he said to get where he is came from my last three books. They're almost word for word from my last three books. I can quote you chapter and verse going back two years, which is why I like him so much. I don't know him personally. I don't like him because of his shoes. It's not I like him because of his wife or his hairdo. I like him because ideas reflect my ideas because they came largely from my books. Go and look it up. Take a look at Stop the Coming Civil War and see if many of the things that Trump is saying don't come verbatim from my plan to save America. They do. That's why he and I resonate so well. I Sometimes I listen to him and I say, wow, that makes sense. I look it up. There it was in my book. So there are people who work for him who get, his, get their ideas from very varied sources, and one of the sources are my books, in my opinion. However, if he now doesn't pay attention to what I'm saying and starts going outside the field of sanity and starts listening to these idiot consultants who destroyed Romney, he's going to go by the way of Michelle Bachman, in my estimation. It's that simple. So I'm not attacking Trump. I'm attacking his advisors, who I think are taking him down the wrong roads. It's, that, it's, it's clear as a bell to me what's happening. And only time will tell whether I'm right. I hope he doesn't flame out because the last thing we need is, is one of the uh, communists to run the country. Speaking of the communists, a very fine filmmaker named Spike Lee, he actually is a good filmmaker, incidentally. I know a lot of you resent him, but he's really quite a good filmmaker. Some of his movies were great. I think I had The Son of Sam I liked the best, actually, looking back on the movies he made. That was an eerie movie about Berkowitz the murderer. Spike Lee is a fabulous filmmaker, but a total, uh, I don't know what to say, everyone's entitled to their opinion, even Spike Lee. But he put out a South Carolina radio ad for Bernie the commie in clip number 24, which you have to hear on the Savage Nation. Wake up. Wake up, South Carolina. This is your dude, Spike Lee. And I know that you know the system is rigged. For too long, we've given our votes to corporate puppets. Sold the okie doke. Bernie takes no money for corporations. Nada. Which means he is not on the tape. And when Bernie gets in the White House, he will do the right thing. How can we be sure? Bernie was at the March on Washington with Dr. King. He was arrested in Chicago for protesting segregation and public schools. He fought for wealth and education equality throughout his whole career. No flipping, no flopping. Now, listening to his voice, we know why he's behind the camera, not in front of it. I never knew he had such a poor voice. He really ought to consider getting someone to read his lines for him because this guy is not made for radio. <laughs> This guy's made for an eye behind the camera. That's about it, embossing people around with his hands. Again, he threw in corporate puppets. I, don't you love that every other word from these left wingers is corporate, 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 corporate band, corporate band, co 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 corporate, the chickens, co 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 corporate band. The new watchword is corporate. What do they even know what they're talking about? Where do you think he gets his money from, Spike Lee? Was he get it from the people in the street? He gets it from the housing projects? He goes to corporations and begs them for the money to make his movies. Who is he fooling? The whole Hollywood system is built on corporations that know how to make a buck. What do you mean corporate? That's the new watchword now, corporate bad. That's the new, the new, the hula hoop now of the left is corporate. Corporate farming is bad. They provided more food for more people than ever, ever seen in the history of mankind. Corporate, corporate's bad. 
What would you want to grow your own vegetables and raise your own chickens? I love all these people who live in apartments. They live in re buy drinks, restaurant. Where does the food come from, idiot? It comes from the corporate farmers. I never saw anything like the naivety and the idiocy that passes for conversation. Except today in America, it's getting worse by the day. So now let's go back to f some of the topics, some of the calls on the Savage Nation. Bill on WFTL in Florida. Welcome to the program. Go ahead, please. Yes, we nearly never disagree, Doc. But on this Sarah Palin matter, I think there's something that we should consider. Aren't you the guy from New York who changed his station and his... I recognize your voice. You Don't you call from WABC all the time under a different name? On Beach, let's talk about Sarah Palin, Doc. Yeah, yeah, you're banned from the show because you're a bore. I, I have an ear that you can't believe. It's uncanny. It's like a stethoscope on a top uh, heart doctor. You know, a stethoscope is a very great instrument in the if it's on the right ears. I have an ear like you can't believe. I caught him. I caught him. FTL, now he's calling from a bum from New York. He was banned from the show because he's, he does it all day long. There's three rules in radio that I learned in the first two days of radio. One, no regulars. Do you know what happens when you let regulars on a show, the same ones? Hi, I'm Bill from WMAL. Bingo, you turn the show right off. You don't want to hear the same people every day. That's why I took a break from callers yesterday, because it creeps like him. The guy just now, it's like a plague, like flies. It's like horse flies, you can't get him out of the stable. Buzzing, they buzz around. If I have to go to call, no calls again, I'll do it. If I get another, another uh, regular, it's over. I'm, I'm getting sidetracked already. I can see the energy is waning. I moved off the Guantanamo. I don't want to do this anymore. Play me some Cuban music like Chocolate now to get my energy back up. Because I think I'm going to go have a piece of Chocolate and a cup of... Oh, I didn't have coffee today before the show. That's what's the, the missing link. I was reading the coffee drinking, excessive coffee drinking... Another the discovery, how good it is for you. One day, caffeine's going to kill you, wipe you off. The next day, it saves you, wipes out liver cirrhosis. Every other day, there's another story about coffee. The greatest substance ever ever found in Ethiopia was the coffee bean. There's one thing from Africa i got to thank them for is uh, Cafe Arabica. It's wonderful. It's the one thing the Arabs gave the world after the zero that I really appreciate. They gave us the zero, and they, then they gave us the uh, coffee, be the coffee uh, bean from, uh, from Ethiopia. Another thing the Arabs gave the world now that I think about is the distillation of alcohol. Fabulous. Before that, the uh, Euros were only making wine and beer. They didn't know how to make uh, distilled liquor. The Arab uh, chemists knew how to distill alcohol, and they made the hard stuff. It's, uh, it's ironic because they don't drink. It's ironic. Muslims don't, aren't allowed to drink, but they knock down pretty good liquor down there in Saudi Arabia. I knew guys who worked in the oil business. Yeah, the robes. and Behind the robes, you know what they're like? <laughs> Are you kidding me? The, oh, no, you can't touch that. So 50 lashes to you. Did you get the Johnny Walker? Yeah. Right. Cases of it is flown in by US C-47. Uh, whatever they, they fly, not C-47. The big ones. Probably a straddle cruiser they bring in their booze for the bums in Saudi Arabia. They got to bring it in every month, a load. Bring it in. Oh, you're nothing. You can't touch it. It's against the Quran. Can't touch that stuff. Don't you? 50 lashes, hands get cut off. They're knocking down the booze. They got the women kidnapped in the rugs brought in from Denmark. Judge questions Clinton motive for server. Where was Oh, so distillation. They distilled alcohol, and they could make the really strong stuff. They don't drink the wine and the beer over there. They like the distillation that their ancestors came up with. All right, so let me ask you this, a simple question. You're listening to the show. You're all interested in politics up to a point. Then you're not interested. Then enough is enough. How many... How many primaries and secondaries and tertiaries and quaternaries can we take? How many primaries, secondaries, tertiaries and quaternaries can we take in this country? When will this endless campaign come to an end? It is grueling. It's grueling. It's like a disease that's starting to wear me out. This is going to go on now until November. I can't believe this. And then, wait, you think it's over in November? No. This guy in the White House is like the guy who has a tube of toothpaste that he squeezed everything out of. And then in the last three months after the election, he will take a hammer to the toothpaste that he squeezed out and squeeze more out of it. So here we are. What kind of voter are you? How do you define yourself politically? I want you to try to think. Instead of trying, I want you to think about what I'm going to say to you. Instead of being a middle school level knee jerk conservative, which has very little meaning or value today. The whole campaign right now is like at the middle school level. It's run by and for knee-jerk conservatives on the Republican side. 
Uh, it's all about holier than thou. Remember we used to detest people who were holier than thou, how we hated them? Well, now you got people who are playing the game of I'm more conservative than thou. I determine who is a conservative, and you, uh, you do not pass the test, Mr. Trump. You're not conservative enough for me. Ted Cruz is not, and now the holier-than-thou candidate. If you're not as conservative enough for him or you're not as Christian enough for him, not as clean as him, I mean, forget about it. So how do you define yourself pol politically? Are you a values voter? Are you a party activist? Are you a feminist? Are you a libertarian? Are you a gun enthusiast? Would you de define yourself as a cynic? A lot of people would say that they're cynics. They don't believe in anything. The reason they listen to me is because I'm cynical. They like the cynical part of me. They don't like anything else. Are you an isolationist? Would you be a socialist, perhaps? Madam, are you a capitalist? You identify as devoutly religious, neoconservative, optimist, pessimist, true believer, anti-Wall Street, anti-corporate, or politically incorrect. If any of those apply to you, I'm sorry to say that you're like everybody else <laughs> in the United States of America where there's so much overlap. And so we now go to the headlines I didn't touch yet, which I really wanted to talk about. I touched some of them. The crazy, insane administration has just said immigrants with AIDS and STDs are now welcome. Now you're welcome if you have AIDS or STDs. That's number one. Immigrants with HIV and STDs will, will now be admitted to the United States of America. Inadmissible today, maybe tomorrow they will be admiss, admitted, would be those with syphilis, gonorrhea to TB and leprosy. You know, oh, wow, that's showing real spine and, and brains there in the HHS. They're not letting in lepers? How, how is that even possible? Just think of the Democrats they could have if they brought in lepers. So now they're letting in people with HIV and STDs, saying the communicable diseases are not a threat to the U.S., even though it'll cost us maybe a billion dollars a year to treat them. The minute they get here, it's like they hit the, the, goal, the, they hit the, uh, the, the, the lottery. Free medication, free treatment, around the clock. But they won't admit you if you have TB, leprosy, syphilis, gonorrhea. That's today. They're not that liberal. Are you kidding? Don't think they're that liberal. Back in a minute. Here's a very telling article. Marco Rubio will skip CPAC, which is the preeminent conservative gathering in 2016. Plans to snub the conservative political action conference this year. It won't show up at all, according to Breitbart News. Now, why would he ditch a, an organization's event, the main event of the year, hosted by the American Conservative Union. Why would he do that? It going to be held right after Super Tuesday from March 2nd to the 5th. That Rubio is skipping the preeminent annual conservative gathering of thousands of activists in a presidential election year, I think tells you very much about the direction of his campaign. And that has to do with the fact that his supporters are open borders guys. The others are going to be there, Trump, Cruz, Carson. They will be at CPAC this year. They've all attended the gathering in the past several years. In the past, Rubio attended along with his mentor, Jeb Bush. They appeared in 2015. But Rubio won't be going. Why? Because he's for open borders. And that tells you all you need to know about Rubio. So if you want open borders with an R next to a guy who really should be a D, Vote for Rubio. He may go to some lesser conservative gathering that we never heard of. I don't know. He may create his own, some front group. Call it the Rubio Conservative Convention, the RCC. Back in a minute on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is. Michael Savage. There must be some kind of way out of here. Say the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. Businessman there. The drink right, my Loading into hour number three, we are on the Savage Nation. So for an hour and a half, we talked about Guantanamo, 
the thin man in the White House has a desire to close it. It's one of his uh, punch list items that he hasn't gotten to yet. Taking your guns is on the last on the list. He's saving that for the last three months. He'll come up with some executive action, which will make you a felon if you own a gun. So in uh, 2010, in 2009, Obama came to power with a punch list. And he's passed everything he's ever wanted and then some. But now he wants to close Guantanamo. Remember, detaining the enemy during wartime is lawful. It complies with domestic and international law. Guantanamo contains guilty men. They're America's sworn enemies. I believe that if any of them are innocent, they would have been released already. If they're not innocent, they should be executed, as Nazis were during World War II by FDR, one of Obama's mentors. By moving them to the United States of America and granting them additional rights and privileges, we're talking about some of the worst people on the planet. Do they have any idea what this litigation would cost? Here is a psychotic administration that has printed money. I call them the greatest counterfeiter in the, in the world's history, Obama. When you think about it, he's a, he is a counterfeiter. He's counterfeiting our currency. He came to power. There was a $1 trillion debt, which already was a nightmare that Bush ran up. Bush ran it up through big government spending. The counterfeiter in the White House ran up the national debt to over $19 trillion. And now he's coming up with this is one of the main reasons to close uh, Guantanamo, which is to save money. I mean, is that not a farce? It's a farce. So we talked about that. We talked about who uh, Donald Trump's running mate should be. I said if it's Sarah Palin, he's finished. I'm telling you, it's, it's over. It's over. She's the past. She's not the future. We want something fresh. We want something new. We want something new. Even, even if you love her, she's not going to ignite the audience the way you may be ignited by Sarah Palin. She's the past. And the thing she said about her son last time was stupid. It was almost like you could see Russia from her, her living room. That's a foreign affair. That, that was her uh, curriculum vitae on foreign affairs. You could see Russia from Alaska. That was a scream. Sorry, but that kind of stuck with me, that one. I know I mean, many of you love her, but it has to do with, with personality more than anything else. She's feisty. She's conservative. She ran a state. I get it. She's done good things. I'm not knocking that. But she's the wrong pick for Trump to be a VP candidate. So who would be the right one? And while you're pondering that, oh, I'm sorry, because I came up with some names. I think Ben Carson would be great. There are others who would even be great as candidates, too, to go along with uh, Donald Trump as VP. Remember, the vice president is... You know, a ceremonial position, but it's also a training ground, sort of, in some ways, except in the case of Joe Biden, to be the next president. He's been waiting in the wings so long, he thinks that the wings are the, uh, are the, uh, the Oval Office. He, think he actually had the wings made into an oval, Joe Biden, because he realizes he's never getting past that oval. So who do you think should be the running mate for Donald Trump? Ben Carson, I think, would be great, but I, I don't know. I don't think he plays that well outside of conservative circles you know i don't know if he would he would he really be like pulling democrat black voters sim simply on race i don't know i know i don't i don't know. i think that they see him as a sellout because he's too successful he doesn't espouse the uh the standard lines you know that uh, that people want to hear the same is true with the conservatives unless they espouse standard lines then the uh the conservatives won't vote for them they got they got to hit the, the points the main points like they've got to thump a Bible, wave a snake, say I'm more conservative than thou. They've got to say that I'm more a Christian than you are. And then they've got to say I'm cleaner than you are. Then they get the, the kosher stamp from the conservative mavens in the, in the media. That's what's going on now. Holier than thou, cons more conservative than thou. I'm, I'm sick of it. So here, I'm going to just diverge, diverge for a moment. Eating red meat may, may up fatal heart, heart failure risk. And it was an interesting story because many of us are confused. For years, you know, we heard red meat was bad for you. Then that got backed off once we heard that, I should say learned, that it's not the cholesterol per se that causes atherosclerosis, which I wrote about in 1970, amongst others, that it, it wasn't the cholesterol that was any, it was not necessarily an indicator of dying of a fatal heart attack. And uh, then people started to realize it was whether the saturated fats were oxidizing 
and causing atherosclerosis through an inflammatory process, and that there was a way to intervene in that process by taking large doses of antioxidants, mainly ascorbic acid, meaning vitamin C and vitamin E and others. And so they say, oh, wow, I can have my meat and eat it too. Then you can go back and have a burger once in a while, right? So people started to dip back into the meat, figuring that the evidence wasn't that strong against saturated fats. It was whether the fats were oxidizing, as I just said. So now this new study comes out, which is very interesting to me, and I'm sure it's interesting to everyone listening to the show. I mean, anyone over the age of 20 or 30 is interested in living and being healthy. A new study says a, a harmful chemical in red meat, like your favorite steak, may put you at acute heart failure risk, says new research. Now, I read it carefully, and I was shocked to find out that one of the nutrients I thought was very important for our energy, which is called carnitine, which is very... See, most of us... Most vegetarians have no energy. I know there are exceptions, but it's true. They, you know, they don't have the, the, the oomph that they used to have when they ate meat. And one of the reasons I thought was because of the carnitine level. Carnitine. Carny meat teen. Carnitine. Carnitine. Carn comes from carne meat. It's a net nutrient called carnitine, which is not harmful. It's actually quite good. However, carnitine is broken down in the body and forms a harmful chemical named trimethylamine and oxide, TMAO, something new for you to worry about. That's a new one added to the nitrites, nitrosamines. Trimethylamine and oxide, TMAO, is caused from the breakdown of carnitine, which is found in meat. So the study showed that patients with acute heart failure showed higher levels of the oxidized metabolite, TMAO, in those who died or had a repeat admission to hospital with heart failure within the first year. So what does this mean? The doctors found, or the epidemiologists found, that higher levels of TMAO, a metabolite of L-carnitine, derived from red meat, is associated with poorer outcomes associated with acute heart failure, one of the main diseases of the heart, Suzuki added. And previous studies have shown TMAO to be associated with mortality risk and chronic heart failure. So that, now, was it a small study or a big study? Is it valid or invalid? Is it along the lines of the stupid science that Obama quotes that 99% of scientists believe that we're dying from global warming? Is any scientist that he pays off agrees with it? Any hockey stick scientist agrees with it? Well, they measured, they measured circulating TMAO levels in approximately 1,000 patients admitted to University Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust with acute heart failure. And the study was published in a legitimate journal called Heart and it claims to be the first to investigate the association of this metabolite TMAO levels in acute heart failure patients. So now it's back to no meat. There goes the hamburger once a month. Now I'm back to, I have to go back to my Spartan diet. You know that for 40 years I didn't eat meat? I craved it, I wanted it. So many days I wanted ham and eggs, which I grew up on. If I were to have followed the diet I, I was raised on, I probably would have been dead at 15. I was fed the most cardiotoxic diet in the world. I don't know whether I have protective factors. I'm starting to think there may be protective genetic factors, which explain why I'm still walking the planet. I mean, I'm saturated with, with vitamins and nutrients that you can't believe. I'm like a walking chemical base of antioxidants, and I have been for over 40 years. Remember, I wrote books. Don't, don't underestimate what I'm saying to you. Back in 1972, I published my first best-selling health book called Earth Medicine, Earth Foods. I've been fascinated by the subject ever since my poor father died of a heart attack at a young age. And then when I found out, I looked back as well. Maybe my grandfather lived. No, he died younger. So I didn't know when I was young what to do because I said, oh, boy, this is awful. Father, rest his soul, 57, first heart attack at 55. Grandfather came over from Russia, worked his heart out, died at 47. I said, oh, that's awful. Now, you've got to think of what this does to a young man who has a family. You're running around with like a gun to your head, not knowing if you're going to drop dead any minute. You know, I'm not alone in this. I mean, America's probably got more cardio neurotics than any country on earth, I would think. And run, everyone's running around thinking they're going to drop dead of this or that any minute. That's the way, way we're conditioned. And we try to, you know, ameliorate the, the risk of that, doing certain things. Well, some don't give a damn and they do whatever they want. And they get sick and die very young anyway. They, they think that they didn't speed up their demise. They did. You know, but at this point, <clears throat> I got to tell you that there's good reason not to eat red meat. So that's that. I know many of you know this. It's old news to you. But you should slap yourself, give yourself a pat on the back for not eating red meat. Don't eat it. Don't listen to those, oh, we don't know. Ho, ho, ho. I smoke cigars. I eat red meat. Ugh. 
Okay, fine. Oh, smoke cigars. <gasps> well, put your mouth next to a tail the tailpipe of a bus if you like cigars. You like you like uh, cigars? Go go put your mouth on a tailpipe of a bus. That's what you're putting into your lungs. I love the people who say things like that and pass themselves off as intelligent people and conservatives, telling you it's fine to smoke a cigar and eat like a pig. They have no idea what they're saying. No idea. It's not about them. It's about statistics. It's about looking at 100,000 people or 200,000 people that you can draw a conclusion from, not the occasional individual. That has virtually no meaning. So, well, my grandfather drank and smoked. He lived in 98. That doesn't mean anything. It means almost nothing. You're looking at statistical evidence, not the individual. So that's what you have to understand. That's the science of epidemiology, which I studied for a while. And uh, there's certain things that we know, that science knows very, very well. Salt, for example, sodium intake. I have lived a sodium free, had lived a sodium free life for years. I wouldn't cook with it. Children didn't get it. Cooked nothing with salt ever. No one missed it. It was naturally occurring in almost everything. Because we only need about a gram of sodium a day. And we get about five. That explains to, to almost the, great, the greatest imaginable degree why there's such a level of hypertension in America. I remember in the 70s when I was working for my doctorate, I'm not allowed to mention I understand it offends those who dropped out of high school or in talk radio. It gets them mad. But I'll mention it again. As I was working for my doctorate in the 70s, there was a large discussion about African Americans and the high rate of hypertension in the African American communities. I wouldn't say community because there's no single community, but amongst African-American people, high rate of high blood pressure. And it was pretty well understood that it was related to the diet. That so, At the time, there was a thing called soul food. I don't hear that anymore, Robert. It's not mentioned anymore. But so-called soul food, which was very uh, de rigueur in the 70s, was just laden with salt, just loaded with sodium. And it had a lot to do with the high blood pressure epidemic occurring in African-American people. Now, I don't know whether doctors even know this anymore because they just put people on anti-high blood, uh, high blood pressure pills and tell them to eat what they want. That's the stupidity of medicine today. Oh, go on now, John. You can eat what you want. Just take these little old pills. You got high cholesterol? That don't matter. Take this pill. You like that strawberry shortcake or the tiramisu after that big fatty Italian meal that can kill an elephant? Go ahead. Have that tiramisu after that meal. Just take one of your diabetes pills. Now you wonder why people are walking around taking all these pills. They're living foolishly, taking all these pills, thinking that they're countering them, but they're only poisoning their livers and their, and their kidneys at the same time that they're poisoning their hearts and lungs. Anyway, I'm, I'm not a purist in that regard, but I do know an awful lot about this field. And what I'm saying to you is it's very interesting to me that newer knowledge which emerges starts to teach us certain things that we didn't know before, and that's what's exciting about new knowledge. And this is new knowledge, because I did not know that carnitine, which I favored, incidentally, as an energy source for people, can be broken down by gut bacteria and form the harmful chemical name trimethylamine N-oxide, TMAO. I did not know that. It was just discovered. So you heard a brand new discovery right here on The Savage Nation. The minute I do a health segment, I know what happens. The call is starting with already the sex questions and the hair hair loss. You know, before I was even on talk radio, I used to do book tours for health books that I wrote. And it was inevitable. Invariably, every city I went to, no matter what the subject was, if we took calls when I was a guest on shows, I'm talking 25, 30 years ago, it would be like, doctor, can you tell me uh, what I can do for male, um, you know, or my hair is going to, all they cared about, no one cared about cancer, heart attack, Alzheimer's. They cared about hair, and you know what? Nothing's changed. If a candidate came along and said, I guarantee, I guarantee you vote for me. You vote for me, I'll make your hair grow. I'll make your EDS disappear. What's it called, EDS? No, that's the name of a company run by Ross Perot. ED, it's ED, right? Okay, we'll start again. You step right up and you vote for me as a conservative. I'll restore American values. Every one of you, your ED will go away. Your hair will grow back. Your pyorrhea will disappear. Your skin will clear up. Women will flock to you. Your dogs won't bark at you. Just vote for me. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it all sounds like to me right now. 
You got to remember, I mean, I'm a cynical guy. I was sinful at eight. <laughs> sinful. I was sinful and cynical at five. That's a great slip of the tongue. I'm a sinner. I admit it. I've been a sinner since I've been born. I'm not a pure guy. Anyone listening to the show uh, not a sinner? Could anyone step up and before throwing a rock tell me you don't live in a glass house? <laughs> now, this is funny. You talk about sin. Watch a sinful marathon of movies condemned by the Catholic Church. Turner Classic Movies has found the cheeky way to mark the run-up to Easter, shining a spotlight on mid-century movies censored by the Catholic Church. So during the month of March, Turner Classic Network is going to air more than two dozen movies condemned by the Catholic Legion of Decency. <laughs> that sounds like something Ted Cruz ought to be running after he loses. <laughs> The Catholic Legion of Decency, an organization dedicated to combating objectionable content in films from the viewpoint of the church. Or Rubio could run it. And through the 1930s, they gave movies grades, A, B, and C, if they were, you know, condemned. And so there were 27 condemned or, or objectionable films that TCM will run. And I'm going to read you the names of them and why they were condemned. <laughs> You're not going to believe this stuff. The Catholic League of Decency? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. So if you're tuning into the radio to find out, you know, the ratings and who's up and who's down and what this and he's moving ahead and that horse moved back and Cruz has moved up and that one moved back and the tail flicked in his face and the horse fly flew into Rubio's eye and he fell to the back and Trump ran ahead. And I'm not going to do it. Not right now. I did it already. Tonight already, you'll find out tomorrow what's happening because it's been decided before they even went into Las Vegas who's going to win. So Turner Classic Movies is going to run mid-century movies censored by the Catholic Church. And the movies that were condemned by the Catholic Legion of Decency, <laughs> I can't help it, they were, they were organized to combat objectionable content in films from the viewpoint of the church. The Catholic Legion of Decency. And the Legion was founded in 1933 and blah, blah, blah. So they, they rated movies. So the 27 condemned films being presented by TCM around Easter include 1933's Babyface, in which a young Barbara Stanwyck uses sexuality to get ahead in life. <laughs> 1956's And God Created Woman, the French film that created Brigitte Bardot's sex kitten image. Have you seen her recently? 1964's Kiss Me Stupid, a Billy Wilder comedy about a singer who must have sex regularly. <laughs> Stop it to avoid headaches. Stop it. I almost, I almost lost my pasta salad. A singer who must have sex regularly to avoid headaches? That's, I never, how could you make a movie like that? Isn't the old joke, no, honey, I have a headache? Where like the, the man, right? And then he says, she says, I have a headache. So to her, okay, I don't get it. And 1972 is the carry treatment, a thriller revolving around an illegal abortion, which is not funny. TCM even found the nun to host the primetime block, Sister Rose Picotti, a member of the Daughters of St. Paul and a film critic. I don't know who that, that one is. She's probably uh, the opposite of what you may think. Anyway, that's a little lighthearted. What else is in the news? This is another screamer. You're not going to believe this one. I cannot, I'm, I'm saying this in all sincerity. This is not made up. The FEC has been ordered by the Federal Election Commission to telling the Jews for Cruise Pack to change its name. I, if I made this up, you would say I'm making it up as a parody. The Federal Election Commission tolls, has told Jews for Cruise Pack to change its name. Why? Why do you have to change its name? The committee, the committee, the Federal Election Commission on uh, last year told them that the pack could not have Cruz's name in its title because it is not an authorized committee of the 2016 presidential candidate. So Jews for Cruz was not allowed to use that name. The PAC's Twitter profile description read as follows, quote, help us fight the Islamic and liberal assault on American Israel. In your heart, you know we're right, and in your guts, you know they're nuts. And at the time, they had 2,500 fanatical followers. So uh, I don't know if this is still running, but at the time, Ted Cruz said, I share a great many values with the Jewish community and the Orthodox community, Cruz said. Chief among them is a passionate dedication to strengthening our friendship and alliance with the nation of Israel. I, I think I've heard that before. That used to be the litmus test of all candidates, uh, Democrat and Republican. 
are you now or have you ever been against Israel? No, 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 no. We're for everything they want. That, remember that went on for you. Then there was the Democrats moved away. They turned against them. They became pro-Arab. Then some Republicans slipped out of the fold. And next you wake up and you got Jews working against Israel openly to destroy the state with a, uh, uh, organizations that Hitler could have come up with in the name of justice and peace. Beyond belief. You have that song, just for fun of it, Robert, did you find it, Joe? Okay, now for your, for your listening pleasure. This is so obscure. It's like a rare enzyme that I play every once a year or so. I know we're in the election season and I shouldn't. But it's a, ch it's a chuckle. Here's a song that was once popular on radio in the 1930s in the immigrant community, which in a Jewish immigrant community in New York. They used to take local radio ads. They still do. I mean, radio stations around America still have local ads. Like, let's say you're in the middle of um, somewhere in Iowa, right? And there's a local radio host. And you could have Harvey's House of Rubber advertising. You know, if... If you're on Highway 403 meeting 209 at the junction of the Grand Junction Mountain, somewhere around where the stables come into the railroad park, come and stop into Harvey's House of Rubber. We guarantee we'll have everything you might possibly need. So they still do run local ads in radio, specializing in the very inexpensive uh, costs for the local audience. Well, in those days in New York, this ad was run specifically aimed at the Jewish community for a, a discount clothing store. Let's hear it. Let's hear a little radio history. One. Joe and Paul, a store of Farkinikin, Bravarilla Joe and Paul, that let your bully creaking, Bravarilla suit, a coat, a geet and zola perfect, I fit and daft here, Kuifen, Norba Joe and Paul. You know, when I hear a thing like that, I could just see George Bush the bumbler listening to it and like nodding along as though he understands it. That's the thing I always loved about him. He'd like go to a foreign meeting, like with an Italian speaking or a German, and they'd stand up, mm -hmm, and Obama does it. Obama speaks one language. That's it, but he makes believe, he understands. They all do, like, mm hmm They hold, fold their hands in front of themselves, and the, the guy's speaking like in Turkish. And he's standing up, mm hmm like they understand every word. They don't know what he's saying. He could be saying, look at this dummy next to me. I come to this country, and this is the best they can do. And he's, mm hmm, mm -hmm yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I, I'm going to hear. You get the joke? Does anyone get this joke in the U.S.? Can I wake you up a little bit? Must everything be so darn serious? Is it really life and death? My friend fell off a motor scooter, but that's life and death. I visited him last night. Not funny. Not funny, but for the grace of God, there goeth I. And we wish you a speedy recovery, Mr. MK. I hope you're listening to the show right now. The only benefit, if there is such a benefit, to being laid up in bed is that you get a chance to listen to my show three hours a day instead of making money to give it away to charities. I hope you're listening and you're doing well. Phone number is 855-407-282. You want me to go back to regular programming? I, I can't take it. What's this now? Oh, here, here's one. He's in the stack. The stack of stuff. The Obama CIA is putting diversity above national security. Really? No kidding. John Brennan, the head of the CIA, is not concerned so much with ISIS or Al-Qaeda or threats of terrorism. No, no, he's concerned with making certain that transsexuals can get into the CIA. It doesn't matter whether they're good at the job. It just matters that they're transsexual. And so he's now going to make certain that there are enough transsexuals to satisfy the inclusion mandate. And they're also going to search the CIA, and I'm not making this up for, quote, unconscious bias training. Do you know what unconscious bias training is, Mr. Brennan? It was written about by George Orwell. It's called Thought, Thought Police. How dare you become such a lowlife as you've become? They're going to look into unconscious bias inside the CIA. He says that he's going to make sure, that, sure the CIA has no form of unlawful discrimination. Oh, we all want no discrimination. We all know there is none. There's no discrimination in the federal government. There can't be, except against white heterosexual Christian males who served in the military. That's the only discrimination that's permitted. You can laugh at them. You can mock them. You can demote them. You can deride them. But other than that, there's no discrimination. However, don't you think it's dangerous that this dummy in the CIA is creating diversity quotas for hiring and promoting idiots? instead of promoting people who can do the job best to protect us? I mean, what was the CIA created for? What, is a social experiment for people who can't get jobs anywhere else? 
So, uh, you know, fine, if you're a transsexual and you're a better person at the job than the next guy for that specific task, I don't care what you do in your private life. But why must you find a qu fill a quota for transsexuals in the CIA? How stupid can you get? And the worst part of it is unconscious bias now. This is not a university anymore. The insanity of what was going on in the universities for the last 10 or 20 years has now seeped into the government as a, res a result of you-know-who. I don't even want to say the name or the initial. I, I'm, I'm going to try to actually not say his name or his initial. He is so offensive. I find saying his name so infuriating that I won't even say the name anymore. I'll just say you-know-who. 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 Where is the sound that I threw? Oh, I didn't even get back to this stuff. I got such good things. Um, okay, so now he's got other arguments of why we should close down on Guantanamo. And he's going to move them around. Here's clip number 10 of You Know Who on the Savage Nation. We're going to work with Congress to find a secure location in the United States to hold remaining detainees. How about These the White detainees House? who are subject to military commissions, but it also includes those who cannot yet be transferred to other countries or who we've determined must continue to be detained because they pose a continuing significant threat to the United States. We are mm -hmm. not identifying a specific facility today in this plan. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. outlining what options look like as Congress mm -hmm. has imposed restrictions that currently prevent the transfer of detainees to the United States. Uh, we recognize that this is going to be a challenge and we're going to keep making the case to Congress that we can do this in a responsible and secure way taking into account the lessons and great record of our maximum security prisons. And why is he so anxious to move them into our maximum security prisons? As you well know, there's a problem in our maximum security prisons of Muslims converting inmates to radical Islam. Now, why would Obama want to even take that risk? I don't think I even have to answer the question. There is one element. One... One, you get the land back to Cuba. Cuba then can develop the land. Cuba then hires American developers who are related to American congressmen and senators to build huge housing complexes and resorts where Guantanamo Bay Prison once sat. That's number one. So there's the money element, the greed. The Democrats are salivating for the resort complex that could be, could be built on Guantanamo. And I can almost name the, the, uh, the developers who will get the contracts. I can almost guarantee you I know who they are without saying the word. You can pretty much fill in the blanks. Just think shopping carts and lasagna, and you'll get the answer. Shopping carts and lasagna will give you uh, some pointers. Then uh, if you want to make a pillow uh, fa factory, you, you put it on Guantanamo Bay. If you want to manufacture uh, enough f pillowcases and pillows uh, to go around, you, you make them on Guantanamo Bay. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is you get, you get a threefer out of this if you do. You close it down, you transfer wealth to the donors of the Democrat Party by uh, building on Guantanamo Bay. Two, you get to uh, seed more Islamic terrorism in the, in the prisons. That's two. That's a twofer. And then there's the threefer. You get to override everyone in Congress who has common sense and loves the country, which is probably the most important one for Obama since right now he's in it only for the, for the uh, pleasure factor of making everyone suffer as much as he can while he still can do it. That's all. And that's a real pleasure for him, to override Congress every way he can. You know what pleasure that is? That's amazing. Say, oh, I love the fine words he gives. They're entitled to this. They're entitled to that. How come he doesn't say that about the veterans who are dying in hallways? First of all, what he's saying is illegal. Secondly, he is acting like a czar again. Listen to clip 11 of Daryl Issa, who's still a fine man, in clip 11 on the Savage Nation about closing down Guantanamo. This has been a goal from day one. He had a full uh, czar whose job it was to close Guantanamo. But the fact that he's willing to do it in violation of an explicit law, an explicit signed by the president uh, determination that he not be able to do it, probably has two things. Uh, one is the fact that he's, he has very little to lose in his opinion. Uh, he doesn't believe the American people who impeach him. And with the death of Justice Scalia, he probably views that the Supreme Court might back him by a four to four decision, even if it's clearly a constitutional violation. Notice that Mr. Issa ties the pillow job. The pillow job was tied into this. Soon after, before Scalia's body is cold already, He's pushing closing Guantanamo. He's shopping it to the girls. 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg's court. Now we have the gobbler. He, he's for, heard from again after he got the coal. Here's old McConnell. Old McConnell had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. Well, here's McConnell, the gobbler. He's uh, gobbling now about the Guantanamo in Clip 12. Congress acted over and over and over again in a bipartisan way to reject the president's desire to transfer dangerous terrorists to communities here in the United States. The president signed all these prohibitions, and his attorney general recently confirmed that it is illegal, illegal, for the president to transfer any of these terrorists into the United States. So we'll review right, we, President I, I Obama's listen to him. Yeah, the malarkey, he sounds like he's throwing malarkey. His heart's not in it anymore. He, he did what he was supposed to do. He's like a salmon who swam upstream and spawned. He spawned the coal deal, and now he hasn't been heard from since. McConnell's like a salmon. Swam upstream, spawned, and now he's got no use anymore. So now he doesn't mean any. Oh, wait a minute. We got the Hillary trying the preacher routine at the Gospel Awards. I know that the sound is bad, but you got to hear this. She goes into this gospel thing that is a scream. Back in a minute on the Savage Nation. They're doing everything they can to stop black people, Latinos, poor people, young people, people with disabilities from voting. It's shame a blast from the Jim Crow past. I thought we had won that battle back in the 1960s. Oh, how embarrassing. To see it rear its ugly head is such a great disappointment. It's one of the barriers that I intend to knock down. She's a demagogue of the lowest order. She'd be so dangerous for America. She'd make Obama look like a prince. This is a vicious human being. How could she say a thing like this at a time like this in America when there are so many people rampaging in the streets, killing people because of their race, killing cops, saying black people are being blocked from voting? What a lie. They're flooding America with Hispanics and they're saying Latinos are not allowed to vote. Well, if you're a non-citizen, you're not allowed to vote. What have you heard of young people not being able to vote? What have you heard of people with disabilities not being able to vote? This is all illegal. And yet this evil woman, who in many people's eyes, who is a, a criminal for what she has done with the email scandal, if you had done one-tenth of what she did, one one-thousandth, you would be in a prison right now. And this Harridan has the nerve. Well, you know the big lie. It was perfected by Goebbels under Hitler, who said that if you tell a big lie often enough, it will become the truth. This is all she has to sell, is the big lie. And that's why I say, despite the internecine warfare of the Republicans, any Republican would be better than this dangerous nightmare who we have already seen. We've seen it for eight years. Remember the furniture had to be returned? She's such a cheap piece of work that they stole cutlery and furniture on the way out of the White House. They were sued and they had to return it. That's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Savage.